everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube for you to increase your neuroscience IQ. Thanks for joining us for another week's video, and for those of you who are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so that you can be made aware of our weekly neuroscience videos. In today's video, we are going to be talking about a case of transverse myelitis that occurred in a patient after she received the second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine that is undergoing trials right now. So today we are going to be talking about what transverse myelitis is. We're going to get into the particulars of this case. We are going to be talking about whether there have been other cases of transverse myelitis from other vaccines. And we are also going to be discussing what this could mean for the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. So sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. Alright, let's get straight into it. First off, we're going to be talking about what transverse myelitis is. So, we are a neuroscience channel, so as you might expect, transverse myelitis is some sort of neurological disorder. According to John Hopkins, it is the swelling of the spinal cord that leads to weakness in the arms and legs, numbness or tingling, pain and discomfort, bladder dysfunction, and bowel motility problems. So if we have inflammation in the spinal cord, we have swelling around it, that can impact nerve function, which is why we would expect these symptoms, such as the weakness in the arms and legs, the tingling, and then loss of control of your bowel movements and your bladder control. Now. 60% of cases are because of unknown inflammatory presences. And so these unknown cases are also referred to as idiopathic cases. We don't know what causes them and the reason is because the causal mechanism tends to be some sort of viral infection that causes inflammation and so this mechanism disappears quite quickly. So just like an infection, our body fights it off, our body fights off the inflammation, and it's been hard for doctors and scientists to figure out what exactly is happening, but we do know that there is inflammation happening in the spinal cord. Now 40% of these cases are because of autoimmune disorders. And so the autoimmune disorders are long lasting. These would be things like multiple sclerosis or lupus. And so those mechanisms are easier to understand because they don't go away and we can continue to look at the processes. Now, with TM or transverse myelitis, what is happening is there's some sort of immune mediated process that causes neural injury to the spinal cord. So we've talked about in other videos the immune response and we've talked about the cytokine storm that happens with COVID-19. But basically, if we want to touch on the immune system for a quick second, if you have a foreign invader in your body, the immune system attacks that invader and fights it off. And some of the things that happen are inflammation and swelling because of the immune response. If we have swelling around the spinal cord, that will cause the symptoms we've talked about. With an autoimmune disorder, what happens is the immune system is attacking proteins in the body. So instead of attacking a foreign invader, the immune system has a hard time figuring out what is actually part of the body and what is a foreign invader, and it ends up attacking its own self, which can cause problems. Something that we have been able to observe in transverse myelitis is elevated white blood cell count in the cerebrospinal fluid. So white blood cells are what we typically think of as our immune cells, that they fight off the foreign invaders. And so if we have a high white blood cell count, typically it is because you're fighting off an infection. There's also the presence of blood-brain barrier breakdown with transverse myelitis in certain areas of the spinal cord. And we also see inflammatory markers like interleukin-6. All in all, it's a pretty rare disorder and there's only about five cases per million people each year. 
So let's get into talking about what happened in our case. So in this case, there was an article in CNN. Basically, an otherwise healthy 37-year-old woman was hospitalized with transverse myelitis two weeks after her second dose of this COVID-19 vaccine that is under trial by a company called AstraZeneca. So she showed inflammation in her spinal cord, she had trouble walking, she had weakness and pain in her arms, and the neurologist said she has been recovering and she began to improve in just four days. Now, when this happened, AstraZeneca paused their trial, but they resumed on Sunday, September 20th, so about a week ago. They did file a susser, which is a suspected unexpected serious adverse reaction report. And so this means that it was a red flag for the vaccine. The whole fact that a billion dollar drug company paused their trial means that this is something adverse enough to halt the science and to halt the trials before going for FDA approval. Now, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who we're all familiar with now during this pandemic, said that he thinks it's a one-off and it would be unusual to stop treatment just because of one case. While it's true that it's hard to tell if a one-time occurrence would happen again, we've seen this happen in other vaccines. So Oxford filed a report saying, in the current trial, we have undertaken safety reviews when volunteers in the trials of the COVID vaccine developed unexplained neurological symptoms, including changed sensation or limb weakness, and have paused the study while a safety review took place. After independent review, these illnesses were either considered unlikely to be associated with the vaccine or there was insufficient evidence to say for certain that the illnesses were or were not related to the vaccine. In each of these cases, after considering the information, the independent reviewers recommended that vaccinations should continue. Close monitoring of the affected individuals and other participants will be continued. So basically they said it's a one-time occurrence and we couldn't say that it was because of the vaccine or not. Now the vaccine they're testing was developed from the common cold virus that chimpanzees get. They genetically altered this virus so that it is impossible to infect humans, but they added genes that make the COVID-19 proteins so that the body can build immunity against it. So basically what happens is they took this virus from chimpanzees, they altered it to make sure it can't infect humans, and then they altered it to give it COVID-19 proteins so that your body starts to build antibodies against those proteins and then if you were to get COVID-19, you'd be immune. Now, that means this vaccine is gonna trigger an immune response and that's what all vaccines do, which could be why inflammation is happening and why this patient had transverse myelitis. However, the researchers said that they couldn't be sure that it was caused because of the vaccine. Now we have to think critically about the evidence we have and while we can't be sure, it's important to take everything into account and examine this situation from all points of view. Now the trials were started in April 2020 and they began with 500 people. This is the second stage. They're now testing 5,000 people. Now vaccines have become a million dollar business and that brings us to our question about what is AstraZeneca? So AstraZeneca is actually a multi-billion dollar multinational research-based biopharmaceutical company. And they were leading the race to finding the COVID-19 vaccine. But recently, with the halt to their phase three testing, their stock actually fell. And so this is bad for business because this is all a company, they're trying to make money, and then we have some sort of mishap in the testing. Nobody wants bumps in the road when they're trying to do anything. And so with that came loss of millions of dollars. So this could be why companies try to conceal things. And also with the race to find a vaccine and all these multi-billion dollar companies leading the race, the problem comes to people not wanting to share ideas. 
with science, collaboration is very important, and so these companies might be invested for the wrong reason, and nobody's going to want to share their ideas when they could keep them to themselves and get a billion dollars if they just keep trying on their own, right? Anyway, this could be why there are issues with transparency, and that could be part of the reason why AstraZeneca wasn't fully transparent with the issues at the beginning. The question about whether or not there has been similar cases, I did mention it a little bit earlier. The fact is, other vaccines have been shown to lead to transverse myelitis. So even though AstraZeneca said that it can't be stated for sure that transverse myelitis is being caused by the vaccine, we have to be cognizant of these other factors. Now, there's a review paper that looks at all the instances from 1970 to 2009 of transverse myelitis. What they did was they conducted a search using the keywords transverse myelitis, myelitis, vaccines, post-vaccination, vaccination, and autoimmunity, and they revealed 37 reported cases of transverse myelitis that occurred because of different vaccinations. Things like hepatitis B, MMR or mumps, measles, and rubella, and the tetanus shot. Now, the range of time between the shot and these symptoms usually was about several days or a couple weeks, where in the case with the AstraZeneca patient, it happened about two weeks later. In some cases, it's even longer, about three months later. Now, because it's happening in all these different vaccines, some scientists suggest that maybe it's one of the boosters in the vaccination. So vaccinations usually come with boosters. Some of them, they'll have like, part of the vaccine is generic for most vaccinations and they're saying maybe this is what's causing the transverse myelitis. But it can also just be the immune response of the body that's causing inflammation. There was also a study that looked at 47 patients that came in with transverse myelitis particularly children, and out of the 47 children, most of them had just received a vaccination within one month. Now, we have to be aware that these post-vaccine neurological complications are rare, but they are well described and it's something we have to be careful of. You don't want to be giving the population a vaccine that they think is going to help them and have these side effects that we could avoid if we take time to develop a better one. So we've had cases of things like Julien Barré syndrome, which is another neurological disorder, things like peripheral neuropathy, cranial nerve palsy, encephalopathy, which we've actually talked about in another COVID-19 video. We've seen cases of encephalopathy caused by COVID-19. So again, the immune response causing this encephalopathy could be caused by a virus or by the vaccine for the virus as well. And we've also seen cases of our topic today, transverse myelitis. Just like with encephalitis, there have been cases of transverse myelitis happening in COVID-19 patients as an adverse reaction to the virus. So it is very well possible that the immune response could be instigating this neurological disorder. Nonetheless, if possible, it would be best if we could find a way to make a vaccine that does not lead to these effects. Now, most of these neurological disorders occur because of immune response, so they're mostly immune-mediated. And some vaccines are more associated to transverse myelitis than others. For instance, HBV is the most commonly associated with transverse myelitis. It is about 41 out of 850,000 people that come out of the vaccination with transverse myelitis. The polio vaccine also shows a high amount of transverse myelitis cases, about 1 in 125 to 1 in 800 vaccinations result in this adverse effect. We've seen the transverse myelitis with the H1N1 vaccination, and overall, there's a rate of about 3.7 cases per year of transverse myelitis with vaccinations. Now, the rate of transverse myelitis occurring in the normal population is also around the same amount. 
Now people say correlation is not causation, but the timeliness is a big factor in this situation. With transverse myelitis, we've seen that 47% of the cases came after the Hep B vaccination and 20.16% of cases occurred after the HPV vaccination. Out of these cases, 38.7% had permanent disability afterwards. So not everyone's as lucky as the patient in the AstraZeneca case where she is recovering. Some people end up with permanent disability, which is why we have to consider what could be happening. So what are the actual possible mechanisms for transverse myelitis occurring upon vaccination? Now, we talked about the fine line between recognition of self and non-self proteins. So what could be happening is molecular mimicry. Basically, if the vaccine has something in it that might resemble self proteins, and then we're creating an antibody for those self proteins, we can instigate swelling and inflammation in the body while the immune system attacks the spinal cord and that can lead to transverse myelitis. Another possibility is epitope spreading. So basically what this means is that because the antigens are accelerating an already present autoimmune response, we can have further inflammation. So if the individual already has an autoimmune disorder and an autoimmune response that they don't know about, injecting them with a vaccine could accelerate this process and lead to the transverse myelitis. We can also have polyclonal activation of B lymphocytes, which is bystander activation. So we're activating the immune system, enhancing cytokine production, and leading to the cytokine storm that causes inflammation in the body. We've talked about this in other videos as well. So the take home message is that we have to consider all these factors and we have to be very careful when developing a vaccine. I would say that at this time, scientists need to collaborate now more than ever to help come up with a vaccination that we can get to the public. But most of the time, collaboration helps facilitate better ideas and helps facilitate and accelerate coming up with an end product. So I think it's important that we're sharing all these factors when developing a vaccine and that vaccination companies are being transparent with what's happening in their studies so that the public can trust them when the vaccine is ready. That's all for today's video. I hope you liked it. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them down below. All the links for any article that was discussed in today's video can be found below. So, again, thanks for watching, stay happy and healthy, see you next week.